members of the university, graduates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the university, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this graduation ceremony. It's a particular pleasure because this is the 50th anniversary of the first graduation in medicine, which occurred in um, 1967. So it's an historic day for us. In welcoming you, we also acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land on which the university stands. We are here today to witness the conferring of awards. Graduation ceremonies are very special occasions. They celebrate achievement of goals, intellectual success, commitment, self-discipline, hard work, and often these days, financial sacrifice. Graduands, today is a defining moment in your life. You'll remember this day for years to come, and you should. You'll have photos and other ways of remembering what happened. This graduation is formal recognition of your achievement. You've worked hard, and the granting of your degree is due symbolic recognition. So you are entitled to feel proud of this achievement. It is also my great pleasure to welcome all our special guests here today. The family and friends of our graduates, the University of New South Wales staff who've helped our graduates on their journey, and our guest speaker, Professor David Cooper, AO. Let me say a few words to those of you who are graduating today. I believe that you've shown great foresight. Over the last few years, you've acquired something that no one can take away, learning and education. Unlike many other possessions in your life, it won't be diminished by age or use. In fact, it will be enhanced by both. Your learning over the last couple of years has taken place in many ways, discovery, exploration, asking questions, experimenting, negotiating. It is that educational tradition that best serves our needs as a nation a society that values ideas and is hungry for knowledge, a society which is forever in quest. Your open and active minds are our nation's most precious treasure and your imagination is our richest resource. So use both of them to create understanding and tolerance. I would also like to congratulate all of the members of the families of graduates who are here today. I know that some of the credit for the success of our graduates belongs to you. You have, I am sure, provided not only financial but emotional assistance and encouragement. And you too should feel very proud of the achievements that we are recognising today. It is not often in life that we stop to celebrate the achievements of those we love. Today is one such occasion and everyone here, friends and family, should feel part of this celebration. For those students who've come from faraway towns and other countries without such close daily support, I assume it's been a little tougher and I admire your extra effort and commitment. Established over 65 years ago, uh, the University of New South Wales, Sydney, is now one of Australia's premier universities with 50,000 students, 6,000 staff, and a reputation for world-class research and teaching excellence. So graduates, hold your heads up high. But I assume your memorable experience here at New South isn't just, wasn't just about your subjects and courses. It's been a lot about the people that you've met from all walks of life. So we trust that your education here has broadened your mind and encouraged you to practice understanding and respect for others and for our planet. We hope that your experience was challenging, relevant, inspiring, and of course, I hope that you had found some time to have some fun. Today, you are not only participating in a tradition whose origins date back several centuries, even if our university is not quite that old, you are also joining the alumni of UNSW. Some of you will be receiving postgraduate degrees and may be renewing your vows here as an alumnus or an alumna. So I greet you today as an alumna of our alma mater. I salute your achievements and I rejoice with you and your family and friends on this happy occasion. You are now UNSW ambassadors to the world. 
With that role comes a responsibility to bring honour to the university, not only for those who've gone before, but those who are yet to graduate. So always give your university your loyalty and support. The relationship between a university and its alumni is extremely important. Your success in life will affect the success in the future of the university, as we are substantially graded by society on the success or otherwise of our graduates. Conversely, the more successful our university is, the more the degree that you've received from us is respected and valued in the eyes of the world. So I encourage you to have a relationship with us in the future through membership of an alumni association and to help us continue to grow as a great university. As a graduate, you can contribute to the life of the university and play a significant role in its development by offering it the fruits of your experience and the knowledge that you've acquired here. At this university, we are very conscious that we are but one small part of a community to which we owe a duty, not just to train graduates such as yourselves in a variety of skills and disciplines, but also to instill in you a belief in the community and a willingness to be involved with it. The reputation of the university depends on you and your achievements in the community. Every university also owes a duty to the community which it serves to provide the intellectual leadership which an increasingly complex society requires. I do urge all of you to remember your community as part of your life, to assist it and to be involved with it for the benefit not just of the community but you, uh, yourselves. Different paths have led each of you to this point uh, today. Together, the university, your wonderfully talented and inspirational teachers represented here behind me, your families and you, through your own endeavours, have created a very exciting future for each of you. Your future path may or may not be the one that you are planning today. New opportunities and challenges will lie in wait for you in the years ahead. Each of you will take a different path in life. Your learning has not finished today with the conferring of your degree. Your journey as a learner will be lifelong if you are to stay relevant and remain stimulated. So whatever your path is, I wish you every success. Enjoy the journey. It gives me great pleasure to call upon Senior Associate Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Professor Terry Campbell. In calling to, uh, Professor Campbell, I'd like to acknowledge that this is the last graduation that he will be um, presiding at. So uh, a historic occasion on that uh, front as well. Will the candidates for admission to awards please stand? Pro-Chancellor, I present to you the candidates for admission to awards. In the name of the Council and by my authority as Pro-Chancellor, I admit you to the awards for which you are qualified. Graduates, please be seated. Pro-Chancellor, I present to you from the Faculty of Medicine for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, Hamid Kaur Rwanda Aftar Singh. <laughs> Natalie Shu Yi Chin. Jonathan G. Ern Chua. <laughs> Douglas K. Shen Chung. <laughs> Ian 
Ian Matthias Ng. Su Chin Tan. Elizabeth Jan Fun Ti. Sheng Rong Te. Nicholas Ka Shing Yo. For the award of the degree of Doctor of Medicine, Christopher Allen Brooks. <laughs> Liam Marnie Clifford. <laughs> Cheng Fei Kong. Alexandra Tse Q Lee <laughs> King Phi Calvin Leung <laughs> William Nagole Joshua Daniel Enchi Yap. <laughs> Chi Ting Lewis Jung. <laughs> Xiao He Jai. the degree of Doctor of Medicine with distinction, Ryan Matthew Falconer. <laughs> Rupert Ignatius Brian Higgins. <laughs> Stephanie Teresa Isaac. Claire Amelia Monaghan. <laughs> Stephanie Joseph Nyam. <laughs> Michelle Bippen Patel. Ronnie Daniel Sigi Schneider. <laughs> and for the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine, Manil Lakshan Abegunasakara. Rola Accra. <laughs> Lavanya Vidakshini Arun Suwaran. <laughs> S 
Scott Bradley Ashby. Angus Morgan Buchanan. Madeline Jessica Burrell. Christine Ann Cannon. Sarinda Singh Shahal. <laughs> Wai Hung Chan. <laughs> Joanne Chungyan Cheng. Yulin Petrina Cheng. <laughs> Kelvin Chung. <laughs> Gemma Cho. Ho Yin Aaron Chu. <laughs> Chair Wei Chua. <laughs> Rebecca Jo Marie Davison. Declan William Delahunty. <laughs> Kalia Manique de Silva. <laughs> Andrew Doe. Ji Hyun Do. Si <laughs> Chi Zuo. <laughs> Milan Rafael Alessandro Edinger Reeve. Shannon Bahamer Fadahi. <laughs> Thomas Charles Falvey. <laughs> Yulin Fang. Matthew John Fong. <laughs> Jiong Darren Fu. <laughs> Ho 
Margot Gemmel Smith. <laughs> Timothy Chun Ming Gan. Saranya Gopi Krishna. Maji Ann Grealish. Gita Uma Guruguntla. <laughs> Hakim Shim Shing Kam Ha. Mina Sami Habashi. Anna Amelia Hines. David Patrick Holmes. Jun He Hong <laughs> Regina Hong <laughs> Xining Huang Q Rim Huang <laughs> Jayani Hasula Jayasakara <laughs> Michelle Rhythma Jayasuria. Christina Nilmini Jayaruban. <laughs> Arun Jotidas. <laughs> Rachel Jadranatha. Ashrada Keithy Schwaran. Sarah Anwar Khan. Christy Jung Hyung Kim. Meishan Sheila Ko. <laughs> P 
Hui Lam Kwan. Gina Sweat Ling Quek. Li Xiang Kiang. Richard Yan Jing Lei. Edward Patrick Lamb. Kayla Ruth Leach. <laughs> Vivian Yi Wei Lee. <laughs> Philippa Agnes Lennox. Boon Yang Jerome Liao. Andrew Lin. David Wei Shen Lin. Central Cow Lounge. <laughs> Howard How Ran Ma. Calvin Siu Fu Ma. <laughs> Samir Yash Mahajan. <laughs> Sahil Medirata. Jacinta Ella Jardine Merton. <laughs> James David Scott Milhouse. Elaine Yuching Ng. John Duan Nguyen. Monica Nguyen. Deva Rajan Nathanakamaran. <laughs> Jermaine Jimin Ong. <laughs> Jean 
Shi Kun Au. Senna Park. Sarah J. Parker. <laughs> Vidya Patak. <laughs> Mayumi Amaranthi Rahim. Hevenlia Jebajivi Rajendran. <laughs> Amesala Rajinian Fa. <laughs> Sajib Kumar Roy. Anya Claire Rugendikia. <laughs> Kurt George Seagrave. <laughs> David James Shaw. Rebecca Sabina Singer. Karan Tako Singh. Jihao Joshua Singh. Viktor Sokolovsky. <laughs> Nara Tiara Sugianto. <laughs> Daran William Sukuma. Jerome Weijian Tan. <laughs> Shuning Natalie Tang. <laughs> Samuel Medhat Tofik. Shamalan Tanaskanda. Sarah Erin Thomas.
Richard Chajono. Kimberly Kate Valesta. Nurajan Vivekananda Moti. Louis Hyun Lam Wai. Nicholas Lyle Webb. Sean Jordy Westbury. Michelle Wong. Vincent Wong. Jessica K. Fong Ying Wu. Patrick Kevin Wu. Eugenia Han Xiao. <laughs> Jessica Xiong. <laughs> Waka Yanagasawa. Vivian Wing Yan Jung. <laughs> Jia Yi Priscilla Yuan. <laughs> Laura Zhang. Louisa Haichuan Zhang. <laughs> Frank Yingfeng Zhu. Chancellor for the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with Distinction and Doctor of Medicine, Jane, uh, David James William Brown. <laughs> Jia Li Li. Mike Lin. <laughs> Yi Von Ui. <laughs> Anna Zinia Pick.
Claire Purvis. Chancellor for the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine with distinction, Kawisha Sawandi Aranda. <laughs> Felicia Andriana Aulia. Callum Peter Barnes. <laughs> Jessica Kaur Bindra. <laughs> Jessica Greta Bowen. Dominic James Redvers Bull. <laughs> Bernadette Madeline Cameron. <laughs> Alan Siskit Chow. Andy Zilin Chen. <laughs> Alex Wei Chung. <laughs> John Nicholas James Colgan. Elizabeth Heather Dalton. <laughs> Odetta Helen Celia Davison. <laughs> Guy Marcus Dennis. Madeline Sarah Didsbury. <laughs> Nagus Ebrahimi. Julia Michaela Fattore. <laughs> Oliver Fio. <laughs> Brett Fievelman. Michael Kartik Gounder. <laughs> Jane Jingming Guan. <laughs> Bridget Ann Hall. Ellen Mary Hinch. <laughs> Ms. 
Matthew Ho Chuen Ip. Viran Rakshita Jayanetti. Chinmay Kantka. Tai Yang Kim. Monish Mavin Maharaj. Emma Jane Mason. Alexander Hayden McColl. Andrew David John McKeon. Lucy Patrice McMullen. Aishwarya Madhur. Satya Sankara Narayanan. Paul Huang Nguyen Pham. Genevieve Kerry Postlethwaite. Anita Puvanendran. <laughs> Amity Mary Ellen Ryan. <laughs> Chintan Preet Singh. Ariella Jessica Smith. <laughs> Rebecca Lee Simons. <laughs> Ji Xuan Kathleen Tan. Ian Teng Wang Yu. <laughs> Kristen Megan Twibble. <laughs> Esther Ya Chun Zhu. Pro-Chancellor for the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with Distinction and Doctor of Medicine with Distinction, Lucy Ping Aitchison. <laughs> Rabindro Chatterjee. K. 
Kathy Kexin Kui. Dushyant Ayer. Nathan John Jamison. Andrew William Calm. Renee Alexis Lawrence. <laughs> Philip Kengpan Lo. <laughs> Alan Ho Wai Ng. Nadia Menik Pereira. <laughs> Kevin Yu Yong Tan. <laughs> Rengan Vijaya Kumar. Priyanthi Widana Patirana. Azri Wijayanti. Isabella Elizabeth Byatt Wilson. <laughs> Mikey Min Ji. <laughs> Jan Zhang. Chancellor, for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine and Bachelor of Science Medicine Honours with Honours Class II Division I, Tahia Amin. <laughs> Zoe Ningji Lee. Udit Nindra. <laughs> we Jun Hendra Irawan Tan. <laughs> and Pro Chancellor for the same degrees but with honours class one, Tariq Afsal Chu. Daniel Yong Tse Yo. <laughs> Pro Chancellor, for the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with Distinction and Doctor of Medicine and Bachelor of Science Medicine Honours, with Honours Class II, Division I, Willem Alexander Henskins. And for the same degrees, but with honours class one, 
Jessica El Masri. And Emily Mary O'Brien. Pro-Chancellor for the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with Distinction and Doctor of Medicine with Distinction and Bachelor of Science Medicine Honours with Honours Class II, Division I, Momina Manan Bhatti. <laughs> and Dominique Anna-Louise Tynan. And for those same degrees, but with honours class one, Deborah Anna May Barber. <laughs> Patrick Chan. Vanessa Xuenwen Chen. Elizabeth Chong. Danielle Malini Christmas. Arundran Balu Elangovan. <laughs> Tae Hwan Lee. <laughs> Priya Marashwari. Joshua William Mortimer. <laughs> Hannah May Uable. <laughs> Annalise Judith Unsworth. Dominic James Vickers. <laughs> Sohaib Amir Virk. <laughs> Ashley G. Pro-Chancellor for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine and Bachelor of Arts with distinction, Sophie Ann Alpen. <laughs> Pro-Chancellor for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with distinction and Doctor of Medicine with distinction and Bachelor of Arts with distinction, Rachel Wei Chung Ng. Pro-Chancellor for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine and Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Arts and Social Sciences Honours with Honours Class 1, Johannes Allen Gucha Holland. <laughs> Pro
Pro Chancellor for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with Distinction and Doctor of Medicine with Distinction and Bachelor of Arts with Distinction and Bachelor of Arts and Social Sciences Honours with Honours Class I and the Universal University Medal in Philosophy, Thomas David Reisfeld. Pro Chancellor, for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies and Doctor of Medicine with distinction and the Foundation Year Graduates Medal, Matthew Thomas Rubick. Pro Chancellor, for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with Distinction and Doctor of Medicine with Distinction and Bachelor of Science Medicine Honours with Honours Class I and the Foundation Year Graduates Medal, Niranjali Shawani Jain. Pro Chancellor, in recognising the important responsibilities that future medical practitioners have been admitted to their degrees today will assume as servants of society in promoting the health of humankind and the healing of the sick, I'm pleased to report that the class of 2016 seeks your leave. <laughs> I'll start again, sorry. That's an understandable one, the same surname. <laughs> Pro-Chancellor, for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Medical Studies with distinction and Doctor of Medicine with distinction, and a very important one, and the University Medal and Bachelor of Science Medicine Honours with Honours Class I, Jaranjali Vijaya Jain. I'm very sorry about that. I think they set me a trap for my last graduation. <laughs> I'll start the previous speech again. Pro-Chancellor, in recognising the important responsibilities that the future medical practitioners who've been admitted to their degrees today will assume as servants of society in promoting the health of humankind and the healing of the sick, I'm pleased to report that the class of 2016 seeks your leave to make a public declaration concerning their intention with regard to these awesome responsibilities. This graduating class of the medicine program has drawn on the Hippocratic Oath to demonstrate the continuing relevance of this traditional oath in medicine. Would the graduates please stand? Ladies and gentlemen, the Dean will lead the recitation of the declaration which has been prepared by this class and which is printed in the program. This is a public declaration which the graduates make in the presence of their families and friends, their teachers and other members of the university. Accordingly, as a symbol of our support for these new graduates that they may live by the declaration throughout the, their professional lives, may I ask graduates the academic staff and the rest of the assembly to stand. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, would all the graduates who choose of their own volition to make this declaration to themselves and to this assembly 
please join me in the recitation of the medical declaration, which can be found towards the back of your program. I solemnly pledge to practice medicine with conscience and dignity. I will think critically, creatively and compassionately and always put my patient's best interest first. I will do no harm, whether out of negligence, pride or indifference. I will see the whole patient and use my knowledge and skills to prevent and alleviate suffering. I acknowledge that to cure is not always possible and I will provide whatever good I'm able to while respecting the dignity and autonomy of every person. I will keep the confidences of my patients and will not breach the trust invested in me as their advocate and ally. I will recognise my limits and ask for help, the need for ongoing learning and will continually improve my practice. I will pass on my knowledge and experience to my colleagues and students and remember the generosity of those who have taught before me. I will use my training and professional standing to advocate for change that addresses health inequities. I will maintain my own well-being and enjoy my work so that I can best serve my patients. I recognise the privilege of practising medicine and pledge that these principles may guide my actions as a doctor. Promises solemnly, freely and upon my honour. Please be seated. Thank you. Pro Chancellor, I would now like to present to you for the award of the degree of Doctor of Science, Tuan Van Nguyen. I now ask that Professor Tuan Van Nguyen stand for his citation. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Over the past 25 years, Professor Nguyen's contributions to the field of osteoporosis have established him as a distinguished authority. As an early contributor to the Dubbo Osteoporosis and Epidemiology Study and in collaboration with his colleagues, they produced seminal works that identified how lifestyle factors, including smoking and physical activity, as well as body mass index or hormones such as estrogens, contribute to bone mineral density. Using his published works, he has devised fracture risk models which have changed clinical practices and healthcare policies. His innovations in the application of mathematical and statistical models have supported the development of predictive tools for osteoporosis, in particular the Garvin Fracture Risk Calculator. His contributions have profoundly advanced the understanding of osteoporosis and its causes and have resulted in the recognition of Professor Nguyen as an internationally leading authority in the field. With more than 250 peer-reviewed articles published in the most prestigious journals in the field, which have been cited more than 18,000 times, he's one of the most highly cited scientists in the field. He's widely regarded as an international expert and has or still serves as an academic editor, associate editor or editorial board member for several international peer-reviewed journals his contribution to the scientific community extends beyond those roles, as he also regularly contributes to reviewing manuscripts and grant applications for international journals and funding agencies. Professor Nguyen has actively contributed to the education of future clinicians and researchers, acting as supervisor or mentor for several PhD students and postdoctoral fellows. Professor Nguyen has also been heavily involved in promoting the advancement of science and education in Southeast Asia, in particular Thailand and Vietnam, where he has conducted more than 20 workshops over the past 15 years on various topics, including research methodology, scientific writing, or epidemiology and biostatistics. More recently, he has established a bone and muscle research laboratory at the Ton Duc Tang University to support both clinical and research projects and his continuous efforts towards promoting research in Vietnam have been widely recognised through awards and honours. Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Tuan Van Nguyen.
The Vice Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence is to be presented by Professor Terry Campbell. Pro Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor's Awards for Teaching Excellence were established in 1989 to encourage, recognise, and reward excellence in teaching by members of staff. Today I'm very pleased to present the Best Network Team, led by Professor Gary Veelan from the School of Medical Sciences. I now ask the Best Network Team to stand for their citation. The Biomedical Education Skills and Training, or BEST Network, was established through a collaboration between leading universities, led of course by this one, and peak industry bodies to address a critical issue in biomedical education worldwide, the need for air easy sharing of knowledge, expertise, courseware and technologies. The BEST Network team in the School of Medical Sciences at the University of New South Wales Medicine, comprising Professor Gary Veelan, Professor Nicholas Hawkins, Dr. Stephanie Dardell, and Ms. Diane Vukalik, has been selected for this award on the basis of the outstanding impact of the network, exemplified by three key achievements. The BEST Network is unique and clear in its focus on sharing of knowledge, resources, and pedagogy in biomedical education across the Australian higher education sector. Secondly, the BEST Network has developed and implemented innovative technologies which have facilitated improved engagement by students in a variety of disciplines in learning communities at UNSW and other universities. And finally, the BEST Network team has partnered with students to create inspirational online educational experiences, including adaptive tutorials, and virtual laboratories that are incorporated into medicine and science curricula. These resources have been adapted for use in multiple partner universities, strengthening cross-institutional collaboration. High achievement in each of these areas makes the Best Network team a most worthy recipient of the 2016 Vice-Chancellor's Award. I now ask that you move forward to the Pro-Chancellor for the presentation of your awards. Today's occasional address is to be delivered by Professor David Cooper. Professor Cooper is the inaugural director of the Kirby Institute for Infection and Immunity in Society since its establishment in 1986. The Kirby Institute, which until April 2011 was known as the National Centre in HIV Epidemiology and Clinical Research, is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health to conduct research in bloodborne diseases and sexually transmitted infections in Australia, with the ultimate aim of reducing the burden of these diseases for the affected communities. The major responsibilities of the Kirby Institute are the epidemiology and surveillance of HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis and sexually transmissible infections in Australia, including research aspects and the coordination and conduct of clinical trials in innovative therapies and vaccines, as well as active clinical and laboratory research programs. In addition to his role at the Kirby Institute, Professor Cooper is also a physician to the HIV Immunology Unit at St Vincent's Hospital, Sydney. Internationally, Professor Cooper is recognised as a leading HIV clinician and clinical investigator. He is past president of the International AIDS Society and past chairman of the World Health Organization UN AIDS HIV Vaccine Advisory Committee. In 1996, he co-founded HIV NAT, 
a clinical research and trials collaboration based at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Centre at Chula Longkorn University Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand. He is actively in involved in studies of biomedical prevention and therapeutic optimisation strategies for HIV infection in the developing world. He is an author of more than 900 published scientific papers and is on the editorial boards of several international journals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor David Cooper. Pro-Chancellor, Dr. Jennifer Alexander, Professor Terry Campbell, fellow academics, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. First, I want to congratulate every graduate here today on your achievements and every partner, family member and friend here supporting you. Traditions and ceremonies like these are important to mark our major milestones, but I urge you to see today, not to see today, as the end of something, but of course the start of your next chapter and also the start of choices you need to make. You all finished the university component of your training some months ago and most of you will now be busy at the next stage, probably do doing those long hours of internship on your path to registration. You've been trained in the most up-to-date techniques to address a traditional model of health. The sick patient comes to you and your job is to diagnose and heal. Have you asked yourself yet whether that role will keep you professionally engaged or even excited for the next 40 years? Or have you thought about whether your pathway as a health professional might be more usefully spent in population health and prevention, health administration, industry, or even academic life? Or if you're very lucky, as I have been, you might be able to take up a number of these options. I've been thinking a lot about the way you are trained compared to the way I was trained, and compared to the way that the people who taught me were trained. My teachers, when they graduated, were using first-generation mercurial diuretics and digitalis to treat cardiac failure. They used rotating tourniquets for pulmonary edema in the emergency department, called somewhat inappropriately casualty in those days. The standard treatment for gastric ulcers was bed rest, antacids and tranquilizers. That a stomach ulcer could be caused by a treatable infection was considered totally off the wall by the medical orthodoxy of the times. Yet in a generation, the 2005 Nobel Prize winning discovery of helicobacter infection as the cause of stomach ulcers by Marshall and Warren has changed the face of gastroenterological practice forever. My generation experienced the epidemic of coronary artery disease. We watched numerous coronary care units being rolled out in the 1960s and 70s. The Nobel Prize winning discovery of statins by Brown and Goldstein in 1985, together with coronary artery bypass surgery from which I have benefited benefited personally, but sadly my late father did not, changed cardiological practice totally. In the 1970s, medical imaging was limited. Radio-opaque barium meals and barium enemas were routine with poor diagnostic yield compared with the much better results for endoscopy and colonoscopy today. Can you picture being without computerised tomographic scans and magnetic resonance imaging today? But then, for example, to investigate severe headaches and to exclude brain tumours, we might have used four-vessel cerebral angiography or air encephalograms to outline the brain. 
leaving the patient flat in the ward, sometimes for up to a week to recover from an even worse headache. Or a person with a fever of unknown origin may have spent up to six weeks in hospital having multiple investigations, often ending up with a diagnostic laparotomy, which more often than not failed to yield a diagnosis. The revolution of the CT scan and MRI has changed the face of investigation beyond belief, and with many new improvements, future imaging will continue to become increasingly sophisticated. The message here, of course, is that over the next 20 or 30 or 40 years, you'll need to be flexible to receive change of many types and from many directions and to learn how to best use those advances in your health practice. And I'm not only speaking about your medical practice, but your professional engagement with the institutions in which you find yourselves. Unusually, even for my generation, I've been at St Vincent's Hospital here in Sydney in one way or another since 1969, a long way back into the last millennium medical student, intern, resident, registrar, research fellow, staff specialist, and on up to professor of medicine and a bunch of other titles. In that time, I've seen eight CEOs of the hospital, although at the beginning they were called medical superintendents, senior doctors who understood the clinical issues on the wards. Later, they became non-medical, trained health professionals and administrators running the hospital. I've seen at least 10 changes in strategic planning, vision statements, strategic direction, governance structures, reporting mechanisms. In short, every bureaucratic piece of management speak ever invented in 40 years. The key question you should ask when you are confronted with this sort of change is whether delivery of medical care within the hospital or institution has improved or will improve as a result of all that. And another key question is, could it have been done better? I'm encouraging you here to challenge change for change's sake but at the same time to be open to change that will improve the end product, which is delivery of quality care. This might mean that you will need to be part of the continuing role of doctors inside the health administration structure in an advisory role or more to represent your colleagues and your patients, or you might choose to support those colleagues who take that role to represent you. Either way, I ask you all to be alert to the need for doctors to take an active interest in the management of their institutions and not to assume your role starts and finishes at the bedside. For myself, I've also been fortunate enough to exercise the choices that have come my way. Initially, after the obligatory internships and residencies, I felt the strong pull of research. For those of you who share my absorption in the endless possibilities of medical and scientific research, let me encourage you. It is an exciting, sometimes fast-moving field with such capacity for human benefit. I feel my research career, which I have happily blended with a rewarding clinical practice has been a lifelong education in deductive thinking, application of knowledge and collaboration with others. I am now and have been for 30 busy years the director of the Kirby Institute based here on campus these days in the revamped Wallace Worth building. Previously it was called the National Centre in HIV Epidemiology and Clinical Research and before that, it started as the special unit in AIDS epidemiology. Those old names give you some of the sense of gravitas with which it was created in 1986 in the face of the emerging HIV pandemic. Every aspect of research at the Kirby is directed towards prevention and treatment of bloodborne viruses. 
The organisation was established with surveillance and research as its specific brief, but before prevention and treatment came death. So many deaths. I hope that your generation of health and medical workforce will never experience the number of deaths we saw in such a short time. When HIV came to Australia, my colleagues and I had almost no answers at the bedsides and gravesides of so many people between 1984 and 1996. In fact, little more than antibiotics against pneumonia and some palliative care. The fear and loathing, the stigma and discrimination were vile. Those who are part of the times cannot possibly forget the impact of the Grim Reaper advertisement to make people aware of HIV. My view, and that of many of my colleagues, was that we were dealing with an epidemic, an infectious disease of the immune system, and people with this infection, no matter their behaviours, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status, deserve the best treatment and care possible. As a young clinical immunologist, I grabbed the opportunity of making a choice to work on HIV and trying to make a difference. Most fortunately, we were supported by the Sisters of Charity, the custodians of St Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, who believed absolutely that people deserved care for no other reason than that they were sick. We worked together intensively in labs, in meetings, in conferences, in boardrooms and cafes, puzzling away at the Gordian knot that was HIV before 1996. In that year, that transformational and wonderful time, we and others in the field delivered the evidence in favour of combination antiretroviral therapies, which have now seen HIV evolve into a chronic condition, something no longer feared as a death sentence. Notwithstanding the miracle of combination antiretroviral therapy, the best way to control epidemics of infectious diseases is through safe and effective vaccines. For HIV, despite 30 years of tireless and well-supported research, as yet, sadly, we do not have a vaccine. For many other infectious diseases, including polio, hepatitis B, measles and flu, vaccination has rendered them preventable. The public health impact of prevention of previously lethal infectious diseases by vaccination is beyond question. Yet, it is a sad indictment of our society that there are fringe members who refuse to have their children vaccinated and rely on herd immunity to protect them. If you make one resolution today as a result of this occasional address, please choose to stand up and be an active advocate for the science of vaccination <clears throat> and not let a selfish minority destroy the best public health intervention of modern evidence-based medicine. Let me digress here briefly to say that epidemics will always be with us. However shocking each new one is, we should never be unprepared to take up the tools we have and jump right in. Epidemics of the future will be substantially driven by climate change and they will arrive on the wing. Flying insects will be the vectors. The Zikas and chikungunyas, the Dengues and the Malarias and all the rest will no longer be the misery of the tropics but will come barging into temperate zones. And those of you with an interest in this field should be standing ready when they come. There will also be emerging infections like HIV, which start like a distant drumbeat and then crash into our awareness, as SARS did and MERS and the misery that is Ebola. While the Kirby Institute's beginnings stemmed from the explosion of HIV into our health system, 
we quickly expanded into our second major area of research interest, other bloodborne viruses. And many exciting advances have also taken place in that field. Who could have imagined a genuine cure for hepatitis C would ever eventuate? Along the way, we have built substantial expertise in epidemiology and surveillance, biostatistical analysis, sexual health, indigenous health, prisoner health, and a world-class laboratory program of immunology and virology. So, the enormous social and financial investment which brought about the advances in HIV treatment have been hugely beneficial to a much wider field. In the same way, the social and financial investment in the education which each of you has received will hopefully be beneficial to an increasingly wide field of knowledge and practice. The possibilities are endless and your choices are boundless. I want to say how much I envy you for what lies ahead. Please make as much of your career path as you possibly can. Use every moment, resist complacency, and keep your eyes on the horizon. You never know what choice for you to make is about to appear. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Graduation ceremonies give us the opportunity to hear the wisdom of an eminent member of society. On behalf of all assembled today, I express the university's appreciation, David, of your contribution to this, our most important of ceremonies. Once again, could you join me in thanking Professor David Cooper? I would also like to recognise the contribution of Dr Elizabeth Tancred, who has filled the important role of mace bearer at this ceremony. We hope that she will continue to do so for many more years, so thank you, Liz. In inviting Professor Terry Campbell to make some concluding remarks, I'd like to wish him all the best for his imminent retirement. Thank you, Pro-Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, graduation ceremonies like today's happen obviously because of the achievements of the graduates and congratulations again to you all. But they're also the result of a number of other factors, including the skill and the hard work of the members of the university staff. I know those of you who are graduating today and your families would wish to join me to thank those staff who have made this event possible. I also believe, and the Pro-Chancellor alluded to this herself in her opening comments, that we should recognise the indispensable role of families and friends in helping to bring the new graduates to this day of achievement and triumph. It's wonderful seeing so many of you here today to share in the rightful sense of achievement of your loved ones. You've been generous in your applause as the new graduates came forward to receive their test amos, and I'm now going to ask the new graduates to return the compliment. Would all of you who've graduated today please stand up and turn and face your family and friends. Please thank them by clapping. and then salute them in the traditional academic way by raising your hats. Thank you. Please turn around and take your seats.
We're just about at the close of proceedings, ladies and gentlemen, but just before I do that, could I remind those of you who were in the rural clinical school campuses, the rural clinical school students, we'd ask that you stay behind as everyone else leaves because we're going to have a group photo in here. So apart from the rural clinical students, would the audience please stand while the official party leaves the auditorium? <laughs>